Okay, we're ready. Recording now. Okay. All right, so welcome everybody to today's um, subcommittee meeting. We are subcommittee one, and our purpose is to focus on task 3A and 3B, or the evaluation and recommendations on flood plane management practices and or uh, flood mitigation and uh, flood management goal, flood plane management goals. And so I am Omar Martinez. I serve as chair of the Upper Rio Grande Flood Planning Group. And so what we're, we'll do is we'll go by each member, that uh, voting member that is present with us, and then we'll acknowledge any guests after that. So I see on my screen, Mr. Dave Hall, if you can introduce yourself, please. OK, we'll come back to 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 Mr. Hall. I also see uh, Levi Levi. Sorry, how do you pronounce your name, sir? Levi, just Levi. like the blue jeans or uh, or the dip. Depending Got it. On it's appropriate. <laughs> All right, I, I, keep, I keep messing that up. All right, no, Levi, please okay. introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Levi Bryan. I'm a, a civil engineer at LCA in Odessa, Texas, um, kind of east of this region. OK, uh, Mr. Velarde. My name is Carlos Velarde. I'm a civil engineer uh, for Valverde County. Okay, I see also Javier Acosta. Um, did you call for me? Yes, sir. If you'll just quickly introduce yourself for the recording. Sorry. Yeah, I'm having some connection issues, so I might be dropping in and out. But uh, my name is Javier Acosta. I'm a professional engineer. Um, I do a lot of floodplain management throughout the city of El Paso. So that's kind of a quick brief background on myself. And then I also see in the chat, uh, last name, Lau. Uh, hi everyone, yes, I'm, I'm with the ACOM team, Urban Planner, uh, supporting Brian with socioeconomics and planning. Got it, thank you. Then uh, Mr. Gilbert Saldana, if you can introduce, introduce yourself, please. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Gilbert Saldana. I'm the uh, senior civil engineer for El Paso County. And I'm also I'm representing the uh, county's categories for, for the uh, flood planning group. Then I see here uh, Lily Cartwright and then Gilbert Andujo. Their cameras are not on, but it, if you're able. Hey, guys. Hi, good morning. I'll go ahead, Lily. Thank you, Gilbert. Good morning. I'm Lily Cartwright. I'm a civil engineer with AECOM. Hey, good morning, everybody. Gilbert Andujo, uh, AECOM. I'm the project manager for this uh, regional flood planning uh, document. So uh, I don't have my camera on today, guys. I'm working from home, and uh, I just don't have my webcam out here on the on my two screens. I apologize. No worries, good sir. No worries. And then we have somebody that dialed in the 915 number. Is that you, Dave? Yeah, I'm in. OK, we can see your camera and it's working just fine. So I'm guessing you're having mic problems. Yeah, I can't hear you or talk to you, so something's going on. You know, I muted my microphone, so there's no background. Got it. All right, I think that's everybody. Brian, that would, I'll leave it then on, on to you. All right, thanks, Omar. Um, so I'm uh, Brian Blaisdell with AECOM. Uh, I am going to lead us through the subcommittee today, and um, I'm, I'm assisting Chris Wright and um, as a task lead on numerous tasks as part of this flood plan. Uh, so one of the tasks that I'm uh, primarily leading is the uh, task 3A and 3B, which is the regional uh, reviewing regional flood plain management and land use practices, uh, as well as the mitigation and management goals. Um, actually, Omar, are you currently sharing your screen? If, if, or I guess Lily, can you request control? Or um, we're going to sh share the presentation, run through the slides. Okay. These uh, are the slides I'm pertaining sure. to the technical issues or presentation of technical issues in the agenda. Okay. Oh, gosh. 
that's not showing. Has this happened? Um, why don't you open it up Before? in, in um, PowerPoint, the, the application outside of Teams? Ah, uh, OK. And uh, if you want, I can share screen momentarily, and then when you're ready, Lily, we can we can swap. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. Okay, great. Brian. Um, so, I guess before we begin, just wanted to give a high level overview of the objective of the subcommittee. Uh, I'd also, if, if you happen to have uh, downloaded a version of the slides from the website prior to yesterday, I'd ask if you go back uh, and re-download re that from the main website. Uh, there were some corrections made yesterday, um, and I uh, just want to make sure you have the latest slides, uh, but those are posted on the Upper Rio Grande website now. Um, so the objective of our of this subcommittee is to both review the practices in the region, uh, as well as setting, uh, having the option, discussing the option of potentially establishing minimum uh, floodplain management or land use standards that could be uh, applied to different com communities across the region to be eligible for their projects and uh, strategies uh, and evaluations to be incorporated into the flood plan. Uh, as well as uh, reviewing and, and coming up with potential goals that will be part of the task uh, 3B. And so we'll, we'll take it in two parts. Um, this presentation will we'll cover task 3A, including just a high level overview of NFIP requirements, TFMA higher standards, uh, different tools that can be used to uh, for, for counties in particular to help uh, regulate um, subdivisions and development with within limited uh, means and then uh, also looking at future development conditions. And uh, for the for the floodplain management goals, we'll look at both examples, short term and long term goals and and just open it up for discussion at the end. Um, as I mentioned, ultimately there would be two sort of two categories of recommendations. Uh, this is meant to be a, the beginning of a conversation, um, so there may not necessarily be any concrete recommendations or action items to be presented at the next planning group meeting. Uh, however, you know if if anything does come from this meeting where we can. Uh, set a particular uh, focus, you know, or even start building the list. You know, th those recommendations can get passed along, and there will cer certainly be an update during our next uh, general planning group meeting based on today's discussion. Uh, and also, uh, um, you may also you may already be familiar with many of these uh, items. This is just meant to be a high level overview, and so if, if there are any details that you that I miss or you'd like to. Uh, in Incorporate or, or mention. Just feel free to stop me as we go, and uh, we can we can talk about each item. Uh, Lily, I don't know if if you had a chance to set that up. Um, I have it. I'm having trouble. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Uh, so. The um, two we kind of already covered this, um, and and this is just to summarize the different action items that could be um, presented to the planning group. So, to begin with, looking at the NFIP requirements, uh, the NFIP uh, enables property owners to participate. Uh, to participate or from participating communities to purchase insurance protection against flooding. Uh, it's uh, it's made available to communities that 
uh, have adopted adequate floodplain management regulations, uh, they must, uh, for a community to participate, they must adopt minimum uh, or regulations, ordinances that meet or exceed the minimum requirements of the NFIP. Um, and then the specific minimum requirements do depend on the types of flood hazard areas mapped uh, by FEMA for uh, each community. And we'll talk a bit more about that uh, in a later slide. Uh, so since since the purpose of NFIP is is flood insurance, you know, gaining access to flood insurance, um, let's talk briefly about flood insurance as a whole. Uh, most homeowner and business insurance policies do not cover flooding, uh, and, and for for communities or for for property owners that do not have insurance, uh, federal disaster assistance can sometimes be an option. However, that requires presidential disaster declaration uh, and will not always pay for flood damage. Um, if, for example, if, if a disaster occurs and it doesn't uh, receive that disaster declaration, uh, which can happen in smaller communities, um, in certain situations, and, and, and so that, there's a lot of steps that would have to take place for that disaster assistance to apply. Um, and so that's not always feasible. And, and so the NFIP tries to remedy that by a lot, uh, in, um, giving access to property owners across the nation and within participating communities. Uh, the, it, even, even with that flood, Flood uh, insurance, however, um, flood insurance doesn't negate the uh, flood risk or the floodplain maps. Do out buildings outside of a floodplain boundary uh, are still subject to the risk of flooding. Uh, in fact, more than 20% of NFIP claims receive one third or uh, are, are actually outside of high flat flood risk areas and receive one third of the disaster assistance for flooding. Uh, so flood insurance is, is a way or is one tool that can be used, um, but it's, it's definitely not a, um, it's not the only tool and it's, it's not, uh, does not um, prevent the, the benefits of uh, Additional standards, uh, floodplain management, land use, land use regulation, uh, and ultimately flood planning, which we're in, uh, undergoing through this flood process, flood planning process. Uh, so the NFIP um, requirements are established at the state level within the Texas Water Code section 1631.45. Um, I lost presentation control. Um, Lily, I just you? shared oh, it okay. so I can. Awesome. Yes. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so the um, at the state level, it points to the uh, it's disappearing. Sorry. Uh, the the state at the state level, it points to the the Code of Federal Regulations CFR Title Forty Four Section Sixty Point Three. Um, and on the next slide, um, we'll look at what those those uh, minimum requirements state. So, just at a at a very basic level, uh, the minimum requ requirements, as we mentioned, apply to communities based on what types of uh, special flood hazard areas exist in the community. So, or how they're they've been represented by FEMA. If if the FEMA, if FEMA hasn't provided any maps or data, uh, they the community will fall under the the top level minimum requirement, uh, 60.3a. Uh, this is also a requirement that generally applies to every participating every every property owner and and uh, um, entity within the participating community. Uh, so it includes subdivisions and utilities. For uh, the next level, 60.3b, uh, th those requirements uh, are applicable to areas that are mapped with 
within approximate A zones. And so those are areas, uh, those are special flood zones that do not have a base flood elevation or a, a specific uh, elevation called out on the flood map. Uh, 60.3 C uh, does include areas where the base flood elevations have been established, those, those elevations that exist on the flood map. Um, and, and then if a floodway has been determined, uh, which is an area where development cannot, um, where the, the water service elevation cannot be in, uh, um, affected by development and it has a higher level of regulation, uh, 60.3 D is applicable there. Uh, 60.3 E is for coastal high hazard areas, so that's not too relevant for our region. Um, but all that to say, uh, within even with these codes, uh, FEMA does, uh, within the codes, uh, or the, the federal regulations do encourage more restrictive state and community regulations and say that those more restrictive re regulations take precedence. Uh, and also the reg requirements are cumulative, so, for, so communities that fall under 60.3C uh, rules must also comply with 60.3 A and 60.3 B. And so I've got a list here of, of the link or links down below to uh, what those specific requirements include. Um, they, they encompass a lot from, um, you know, how per developments can be permitted, uh, the, the minimum elevations for building, for, for new developments, um, specific how, how the structures themselves are designed. Um, so there's a num numerous requirements that uh, that are that fall under the NFIP, but they're meant to promote uh, resiliency from uh, for the community in the face of flooding. Um, so we can go back to this link too if, if we would like to review this in more detail after after these slides. Um, so if you, Lily, you can go to the next slide. Uh, we we looked at the NFIP participation across the region, uh, and about 80% of counties participate in the NFIP. Um, so uh, the five that do not. Um, are primarily actually there is that five or six um there's reeves county and pecos county are the the main ones uh, as well as ward county so kind of over in the pecos area um, um and that's that's one of our primary areas of interest that we've identified that we'll have a uh roadshow meeting later this uh I think we decided early next year uh, as part of the from the general planning group meeting. Um, so a large number of counties do participate. 40% uh, of the cities, towns, and villages pr participate. So there's less participation from cities, towns, and villages, uh, but more participation from the county level across the region. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Higher higher standards are um, beneficial because they again promote high, stronger resiliency uh, and can be used in addition to and above the minimum requirements. Uh, one way that FEMA recognizes those is through this community rating system. Uh, El Paso County is participates in this uh, and is. I believe CRS 9, uh, when I last looked, uh, that may have changed, but uh, is a voluntary program that encourages community practice uh, or stronger community practices. Uh, and it, it leads to lower uh, reduced insurance um, premiums for property owners. The uh, TFMA higher standards are also uh, a common way to uh, gauge how um, 
how higher standards can be applied. And, and the TFMA has compiled responses from communities across Texas, uh, examples of the higher standards from different communities uh, include free board by a certain number of feet above the existing base flood elevation, as well as above the fully developed base flood ele elevation. And those are typically one to two feet above the base flood elevation. Uh, and then there's also standards for how de high development uh, should be elevated above natural grade, street, or curb. Uh, and that's typically uh, one to two feet as well above those levels for different zones. Um, so I've, again, I've got links here in the presentation for reference. Those those are linking to the directly to the IR standard standard survey. Uh, next slide. So Can as I, I mentioned, I yeah. Can question. I, may I ask a question? Sure. In the beginning of this slide, you talked about El Paso being rated nine. Can you explain what nine is in relation to one or two or three or twelve or whatever the other number? Right. Is? Yeah, uh, I think nine is pretty high. Um, I don't know, G Gilbert. Maybe uh, I can answer that question. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to clarify that it's not El Paso County. It was actually the city of El Paso. Oh, I'm sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. Yes, it's the city of El Paso, and actually, a nine rating is a ten is the worst rating, and one would be the best rating. So it's um, <clears throat> just based on different things that they have to submit to the city. And um, yeah, I think they're only getting like a 5% discount on their insurance with that nine rating. So for each point, it's about another 5% uh, discount on flood insurance. So yeah, there's some work to be done and it is <clears throat> very difficult to try and get that rating down. At least it's it has been for the city of El Paso, but. Yeah, so 10 would be the worst and one would be the best and probably a coastal area would have a better chance of getting a one rating because they'd be able to apply for all the different aspects of the, the flood insurance. So, so who is responsible for input to change that rating? The city floodplain manager is responsible for, for the CRS activity for the city. City flood plan manager work for the city. Yeah, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> what what aspect of the city government are they within? That's my interest. I'm, you know, is it the water utilities or you know who is it? Okay, no. can, can I? I was just going to suggest that. It, I mean, I, I think what it is is it's really the community that that applies for uh, the CRS, and obviously. When you apply, you probably have to um, provide or, or show what higher standards uh, your community is is participating in, and based on the number of higher standards, is what FEMA will um, will rate you. And obviously, if it's just one or two, you might get like a nine. But if you're if you have a lot more st higher standards they'll, they'll, they might you know bump you up to like a you know like a six or seven i i don't know if that if i answered that correctly have it based on your understanding yeah that's correct but yeah it, it would be someone within the city government of the city that that regulates that crs all that information is compiled by by the floodplain administrator for the city I guess I'm not getting an answer to my question. I, I guess I'm trying to focus in on who is or isn't doing appropriate work. If, if this is a nasty rating for El Paso, we should be doing much better. What do we do to fix that? Is that something that we can motivate through this process that we're working on now? I mean, it is very difficult to part of that CRS uh, program. And we were having a hard time getting points for that. So it's it's just a lot of paperwork more than anything else. And a lot of, we were getting some, some help with that CRS before I left as the floodplain administrator, but I know they are actively working on that as we speak. Uh, 
to me it sounds like something that needs some significant focus. I'll leave it alone. I'll agree on that. Thanks, Javier. Um, well, you can go to the next slide, actually. So, yeah, I apologize. I misspoke earlier. Um, the The city of El Paso has participated uh, as the one community that we have uh, found within the region. Um, and the the criteria uh, included free board, free board uh, two feet above the existing BFE and the fully developed BFE, uh, as well as two feet uh, above the shaded zone X and one foot above the unshaded zone X. Uh, so certainly room for uh, improvement, but the I, th I think it, it, the city of El Paso is still a can be a, a guide for the rest of the region, uh, which is not currently participating in this uh, or has responded to the TFMA higher standard survey and and is not yet to our knowledge uh, participating in the community uh, ratings system. So uh, just participating in itself, I think, can be a, a is, is a good thing. So um, go to the next slide. So Brian, you're you're taking on as an action item at the end of this to basically do what was was suggested to see what we can do. There's yes. an action item at the end of this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Lily, next slide. Or oh, actually, sorry. Yeah. So. In terms of what can be done uh, or how some, some of the tools that uh, exist for guiding future development are comprehensive plans. Uh, these are more common at uh, in, in other parts of the country. Uh, within Texas, these are limited uh, to cities mostly. Um, the, at the county level, uh, Land use is guided by subdivision regulations. Uh, and through these sub subdivision regulations, uh, counties have the authority to review and regulate uh, land when it's subdivided. Uh, and, and in those subdivision regulations can be included uh, different development requirements uh, for water, drainage, uh, uh, sewer and other utilities. So the Texas Water Development Board has actually established modeled subdivision rules, uh, and those exist as a template which counties can use to adopt and pass uh, expedited uh, regulation. They're already made and, and can be used as a guide. Uh, and actually since 1989, all counties adjacent to the Texas-Mexico border have been required to adopt and enforce these MSRs. So uh, on the next slide, we can see that, uh, again, similar to the NFIP uh, participation, most of the counties actually do uh, do have some form of subdivision regulation in place, or whether it's through the model subdivision rules or their own document. Uh, this The northeast part uh, of the region uh, does have some gaps potentially that we can look into further. Uh, and we also will be uh, reviewing the subdivision regulations in more detail to see exactly how strong each of them uh, is when it comes to floodplain management um, or drainage issues. Uh, next slide. So from the standpoint of future development, uh, there is the at the for the city of El Paso, there's the Texas Comprehensive Plan, um, and the that 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 sets some has some guidance on future land use estimated future land use change. Um, the population growth is estimated by the uh, El Paso MPO uh, Destino 2045 MTP. 
Uh, and then there's also uh, an MPO just east of the region near Odessa Midland, but it it's just outside of the region, and so it's not as relevant, but I included it on the slide for reference. Um, and we, we did find one comprehensive plan for Culberson County as well. Um, next slide. So just to conclude this first part of the presentation there, um, the scope of work has, has a given the RFPG authority to adopt specific uh, region specific minimum floodplain management or land use standards which communities must adopt to include the FMEs, FMSs, or FMPs in the flood plan. Uh, this is, our interpretation of this is that it's an optional uh, decision. Uh, it would, could be a recommendation if, if desired from this subcommittee to the larger subcommittee or to the larger planning group, uh, whether these minimum standards should be implemented or, um, not implemented, but ad adopted by uh, communities across the region. And that would, again, not be enforced at a, uh, it's not something that would be enforced other than uh, but through <clears throat> the community's ability to participate and receive funding in the flood plan. Um, so that's that's a decision. Uh, we can revisit that after the presentation if, if you'd like. Um, Lily, you can go to the next slide. And then moving on to task 3B, uh, where we're looking at short-term and long-term goals. Uh, TWD defines short-term goals as 10 years, long-term goals as 30 years. So the goal, the, the objective here is to identify specific and achievable goals uh, and the specific years uh, by which to meet those goals to include in the, F, uh, the flood planning region. Um, and they should be established either at uh, single HUC 8 watershed boundaries or um, the entire region or collective boundaries of HUC 8s. Um, next slide. So the, the map, this map is just here as a reference of the different Huck 8 regions or Huck 8 watersheds across the region. Uh, next slide. Uh, we've got some examples here uh, of short-term, long-term goals from the scope that could be applied to our region. Uh, some of them include uh, personal injuries, fatalities, uh, so, um, structure goals, removing specific percentage of, of structures from the floodplain, uh, low water crossings, enrolling communities in the NFIP by a certain date. Um, next slide, we can go through this real quick, but um, whether communities have a stormwater asset management plan, um, design standards. So there's a, there's a lot of different potential goals that could be applied. Um, and so in the next slide, um, we we have we've provided an example of. Uh, template of the goal setting worksheet uh, along with uh, actual spreadsheet that was included with the uh, meeting materials. And so uh, with that, I guess we'll open up to larger discussion and, and just see if there if anyone has any thoughts on uh, either those minimum standards that could be applied at a region wide level to uh, for communities to participate in funding through the flood plan uh, or uh, at any recommendations related to goals.
Uh, and Lily, you can go ahead and pull up that spreadsheet too while we're thinking through. Here's the example spreadsheet um, that we'll do for this region. And um, based off of Mr. Hall's comment earlier, I thought one of our goals could be to target improving CRS ratings. Um, and maybe it could be discussed for, that could be a, an avenue to determine the other goals that we might um, encourage setting for the region. Definitely. Um, I think there might actually be two goals in that, which one is improving the CRS rating for El Paso. Um, so that would, there's, we could use the two, we can use the Huck 8 watersheds uh, that overlap with El Paso County. Um, and then the for the rest of the region as a region wide goal that we could have a, um, a goal of participating in the community rating system and, and adopting higher standards above the minimum requirements. Um, for those communities that aren't in the NFIP, uh, how would we go about trying to get those? Because I know there's probably a lot of community involvement that would be needed just to get some of those communities into the NFIP. Yeah, I do agree. I think I think they'd first have to, uh, well, it could be possible that they have the minimum requirements uh, and just haven't, um, don't participate, or maybe they're, they've been suspended. Um, so we, we'll look at, we'll investigate specifically each of those counties that are not participating in the NFIP, see what, uh, what minimum requirements they would need uh, as a minimum, and then those minimum those requirements would need to be adopted at, at the community level. And to do that, that would be where the community involvement would come in um, to pass those uh, regulations and and. Uh, this is Dave again. So is there a two-step process to get the cities involved? Does the county have to be involved before the city can be involved? Um, I think they can be independent, correct? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yes, All they right. can be independent. Okay. Um, what I just put on the if screen Sounds to oh. me like the better job we can do of getting these people involved in this process, the more interest there might be because we're saving money. I, I think that they'll, um, I think there's some communities that probably may be reluctant to participate only because maybe they just don't have maybe the staffing and, 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 and resources to to regulate some of this stuff. I, I think, I mean, I know that sounds kind of odd for for many of us, but uh, I've, I've had encounters with with some communities where they just, um, I'm sure FEMA's already reached out to them, trying to get them to participate, but uh, sometimes they just um, think different. Is there a source of funding inside this program that can help them with that? There's always funding available, Dave. Um, <clears throat> it's just a matter of reaching out through the different programs that are out there. So um, my understanding, I know this NFIP has been around for a while and uh, Texas has been pushing for everybody to be a part of it, but there's a lot of uh, you know, constraints with like what Gilbert said earlier. So it's, it's a push that we can, you know, continue to educate and try and, uh, you know, push any additional resources out there to help them apply for that. Yeah, I, 
I think trying to provide them information on funding sources if they are deficient in these areas might help them facilitate uh, better results. Okay, that might be a goal is to try to figure out how to, how to, how to, to route funding to these folks to help them do what they need to do to lower rates for their population. So you need a goal to participate in the NFI right? for non participants. Can you repeat that, Jeff? You're breaking up. It's, it's like a cascading recommendation. You need a goal for participation in the NFIP for the ones that don't. Currently don't. It's a goal. Is, is I that think what we've so it just sounds like to me that we, we want to have a goal of obviously increasing participation from uh, uh, just just the standard NFIP uh, from from the counties and the cities. There you go. Do we know which communities are, are participating in the CRS? Sorry, can you repeat that? Do we know uh, which communities are, are participating in the CRS program? Um, from what, we'll have to verify, but so far we've only identified the city of El Paso so far. It's a question on our survey, correct? Yes, so, and, and we, get the we are that. still... Sorry. It's on the survey, so we'll have a more definitive answer later. Yeah. You know, and then another thing, I'm not correct me if I'm wrong, but I know a lot of these uh, grants that are out there, like maybe CDBG and all that, you know, ask that a community be a member of the NFIP. To be able to get that funding, so um, that that's a good goal to, to spread the awareness out there for uh, funding and resources for that. How can we make that more um, that goal more specific, like achievable, like measurable? Um, I think at some point we're going to have to figure out what the what the measure is of each one of these, but it may be best now to just include them. Sure. I mean, for example, it would be nice if we could say improve the CRS rating Paso from nine to five or something like that, you know, but I mean, that's an easy one to do, but I don't know what I don't know what participation in the NFIP rating system is how it's numerically rated. You know, I, I don't know. I mean the one the one we can easily say, but and I don't know if five is a good objective either. It might be eight as a good objective or seven, you know, just as a start on the short term and then long term maybe five. So I'm just kind of looking up the CRS rating because I'm kind of unfamiliar with it, but out of a little over 1,200 communities on this list for in Texas, uh, 68 have a CRS rating um, above 10, and five seems to be the best in the state of Texas that I've found just in the, you know, three minutes of Googling. So I don't know if that scales, you know, what is an achievable rating at the end of this process and what's an achievable goal. Wow. I, I don't know if anybody with more experience on this rating system, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that seems to be what I've seen. Is that appropriate? 
Yeah, I think that's about right. From it's it's very difficult to get that down. I know that. So yeah, if if just getting it down one point to an eight was was something I was trying to do, but if we could get it down to five in the long term, I think that might be a good goal long term. <clears throat> So in, in trying to get that rating down, are there little steps that need to be goals that would help us achieve that in this planning process? Is it, you know, community awareness? Is it um, having necessary data to be able to do that? Is it better mapping systems? I mean, one in your experience helps you achieve that goal. On, on my viewpoint, it's just manpower. If just getting enough people involved who are actually doing that work is the issue that I saw. It's just having the manpower to put all that together. Is, is this a, a cost effective thing for the community? I, I mean, I, I perceive that it is because it should reduce the cost of flood insurance, but does it do that or is this a waste of time? No, it definitely does do that, but it just depends how many people are, are in the flood zone. So if there's more people going in the flood zone and it's gonna drop the help the insurance for all those people going in the flood zone or they're in the flood zone or floodplain. So if there's not a lot of people within that floodplain and a lot of people who aren't paying insurance, flood insurance, then yeah, I could see where it might not be beneficial that CRS program. I think Carlos had a question. Hello, yes, thank you. So I remember the, the county was looking for some FEMA grants like in the past three years and one of the requirements was to to, to have a FEMA appropriate are, are you familiar if, if, if is that a requirement to part of CRS rating to have a mitigation plan of, in place? I couldn't hear your question. Can, can you hear me now? Carlos, can you repeat that again? It kind of broke up a bit. Okay, so I remember Balverde County, like two years ago, was uh, pursuing some FEMA grants for flood mitigation. And one of the requirements was to have a FEMA approved mitigation plan. And we here in the county, we don't have, we're working with that. But is that a requirement to be part of the, the CRS rating to have a group mitigation plan? No, no, you just have to be part of the NFIP. Okay, thank you. You know, a, a lot of the CRS has to do with, uh, you know, going above and beyond what the NFIP has. So what you're trying to do is improve the mitigation measures. You go going above and beyond the minimum requirements that the NFIP has. That's what helps you uh, improve your 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 community rating system. So um, the more uh, you know, the higher you know mitigation plans are not necessarily that. Just uh, goals that you have to get you there is what improves it. So you're going above and beyond what the minimum is being required. That's how you improve your CRS system. Your Gilbert, can, can I add something to that? I, I think what, what Carlos is referring to is, I, I think he, he may have uh, heard of somebody applying for a, some type of a grant. And, and I, I, I also recall um, a, a grant applications where they ask that uh, certain projects are part of a, like a, a hazard mitigation plan. And I know here in El, in El Paso County, I know you know we 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 do have that hazard mitigation plan. Uh, I'm not sure if you if you're uh, if you have some more uh, bat, uh, I guess information on that. Well, I'll have to get back to you on that, Gil. I just um, this CRS rating is you know it, it is a number and it's hard to get it down, but right. it's not impossible. But like uh, Javier was saying, it, it it really takes a good workforce to be able to get that done. There's a lot of 
there's a lot of issues out there that need to be addressed. And as we know right now, you know, with, with this monsoon season, El Paso's pretty much suffered through it. You know, we've had some pretty historic events and that, has, that has kind of highlighted some of the deficiencies that are out there. But it's, uh, you know, it's a plan in the working, you know. Sure. And, and I know the city of El Paso is working to get it done. It's just a matter of, you know, having the resources and having the people to do it. So if we could, you know, have some goals set here that, that can assist them in any way and, and the community and the other communities that are out there. I mean, that's the whole the whole point of this plan is to set up goals to uh, uh, to better to better help our communities out there to su succeed. So. Yeah, I was just trying to try to address, I think, uh, Carlos's question. But like I said, I think I've, I've, I I want to recall that that's that some grants do require projects to be part of a hazard mitigation plan, but I've never heard of uh, the CRS being a, a requirement on any of those grant applications. So obviously, two separate. Uh, right, things. and I've never heard of the CRS being a part of it either, Gil. Just more right. being a part of the NFIP and mm -hmm. and again, the CRS is going above and beyond that NFIP right. uh, requirements. But if we're if we're looking at um, potential opportunities to uh, inform and and just be more comprehensive with these projects, we can incorporate these into the hazard mitigation plan for the five county region uh, because the council of governments is in charge of putting that plan together and we should have it um, finalized, I would say by by the summer. So um, this can be a different a sidebar conversation, but we can I can get with AECOM to to have a meeting with them, ready to send this who's our coordinator and we can see what what aspects we can include of the flood plan into that hazard mitigation. And then in terms of the other counties, I can check with the other council of governments to see if they're also working on their hazard mitigation plan so we can look at opportunities to incorporate this information as well. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Good. Just, just a point. If if we're trying to find a way to sell this project to the region, to areas in the region, we need to figure out a way to show them benefit. And if we, if this is one of the processes that shows them a financial benefit to doing something for their members of their community, then it might be easier to, to sell the whole process. Great. I mean, there has to be some mechanism to attract their attention. Yeah. Can I uh, change topic briefly in our last few minutes for this call? Um, I just wanted to revisit that task 3A uh, potential recommendation, um, w which and to see if anyone on the call has any thoughts on the idea of adopting a region-wide minimum floodplain management or land use standard that communities would need to adopt to participate in funding from the flood plan. Is that something that anyone would be? I, can can I touch on that? Um, and 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 obviously, I, obviously, since I, I work for the county, I know that um, a lot of times, you know, we would love to have better uh, regulatory authority on, on on development. I mean, obviously there there is subdivision development and, and obviously that that does provide us the uh, mechanism to 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 regulate uh, the drainage components, but there is a, other development that's not subject to subdivision regulations. And uh, that's where we struggle as 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 a, from the county's perspective uh, to to enforce some kind of drainage uh, requirements on, on those type of developments. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody else, uh, Carlos, if you if you have experienced the same issues or not, but uh, that's what we have here. Yes, good one. Uh, 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 answering that, doing the same thing, uh, mostly in properties like this, the Rio Grande River, where we have no designated flowing or base flood elevation. We've seen a lot of people interested in, in developing in that, that area. 
And the thing that uh, we do have a flood, uh, flood prevention order, but uh, when you want to install a mobile home, the requirements just to uh, raise by four feet on higher adjacent ground, so it's really not that good. And if you want to go uh, about the elevation, since we have no E established, it will turn into a really high structure. So they're just about going with the minimum of the four feet above ground on the mobile home. So I don't, I, yeah, I feel the same way as you, as you feel. Yeah, and, and I, I was actually even um, probably stressing more on even the, I mean, because obviously in the, the the flood order does have mechanism to 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 do some type of regulatory um, control over over drainage, but th there's, uh, you know, like I said, if 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 it's if it's somebody who's developing a subdivision or or if they're in a flood zone, I guess, or flood uh, plain, but outside of those is where you know that there is development that um, we struggle in in, in regulating. Um, proper uh, and adequate drainage, and so I just thought I'd share that because uh, if we do, if we're able to adopt those, or somehow, I think the next question would be: is how how enforceable is that going to be, or, or you know, is, is, are the counties going to be, or you know, whatever entity would be uh, empowered to to, to with uh, that enforcement authority? It sounds to me like the legislate the committee that's responsible for legislative recommendations should be including a recommendation in this area to get stronger authority within the county. So maybe that's a good point to give to that committee that's working uh, legislative recommendations. Yes. I, I see an example of that over here east in uh, Midland and Metro counties, a lot with oil and gas development and construction. Uh, they may build up, you know, a four acre pad by four feet and uh, really have no uh, compensation for that or relation. The counties don't really have any uh, influence over that. They don't have to go apply for a permit specific, you know, with the subdivision. They have to go apply for a permit with some regulations you have, but I think as Gilbert was saying, there's other types of development and construction um, that they have no authority over, may not even know that it's been done until after the fact. So, so Gilbert, could you send to the group the, uh, the typical type of, of development that you can't regulate that you think uh, you would want some help in, in, in having some Sure thing. Yeah, I, I can give you. I can send you some examples of of uh, some of the issues that we've had in in, in regulating uh, development. Uh, and maybe that'll help. And and anything that would help you actually formulating in terms of regulation. Are there are there particular types of developments that you particularly think be regulated versus? So if you could kind of prioritize the ones that you can't regulate that you'd like to in that list so that the more the more important ones are, are identified. Okay. So in so in terms of this list, in terms of the goal, the goal would be to uh, increase county uh, regulatory powers where needed. or improve improve that's right better word thank you <laughs> goal will be measured by success of uh, success of uh, added county powers in Texas I think we need to be specific on what powers we can. Yeah, I think, I think you're exactly right. And that's why, that's why I'm asking him for a list of what the priorities are. Like there's probably not going to be some blanket uh, 
regulation over everything. But critical things that added to the list of miners. That's kind of hey, Gil, but I think another, another one of the biggest issues there in the county in regulating it is that people really don't have permits. They just want to start building. Say drainage regulation, not. Okay. And I don't. I think just delete that goal. I don't, yeah, I don't think you need the words in county out there because you've got county under goal. Okay. So that's Do what we need. To Successful drainage regulation of high priority. Uh, I didn't get that, Jeff. Could you repeat, please? Successful drainage regulation of high priority. Do we need to come up with goals, how goals are going to be measured for each of these one, two, and three? So yeah, we won't we won't necessarily be uh, establishing those uh, by our next planning group meeting, but we'll we'll work on defining how those goals can be measured and present that at our next subcommittee meeting. I mean, maybe just a, some food for thought is maybe we can just try to establish, uh, you know, obviously if, 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 if we have 80% participation on the counties and the NFIP, maybe we just set a goal of like 90% short term and 100% long term or something to that effect. Excellent. So, so talking about more about the minimum requirements such as the NFIP, do we also want to tie those minimum requirements to the flood plan in a way in terms of like which communities would be uh, eligible to receive funding through the flood plan? Or is that too much? Uh, you, would you do you think that would be too too, too much to do it uh, or to ask for the various communities across the region? Uh, I'm just asking because in the scope of work, they, TWDB does grant the RPG the, the authority to do that. Do you think it would be effective? So like as an example, you could say that one, in order for communities to be eligible for funding through the flood plan, they have to participate in the NFIP. That's, that's just. I, I, I completely support that. Yeah, I think it'll give them uh, like an incentive to participate as well. Yeah. What does the 10 and the 30 represent under term of goal? Oh, short and long term. Years, right? Correct. Um, are we working in a is it flood flood process of year plan? A 30 year plan. It's a 30 year plan. OK. My gosh, I would. I would think we'd want the objectives to be much quicker than that and try for them rather than say kind of wait for 90% for 10 years. Yeah, yeah I think that you, particular goal might we could decrease the time frames, but. Yeah, and then we'd also have to be uh, the, the the example that I provided was was for the counties and obviously the cities and towns are it's a different uh, I don't know if it's a different animal I guess uh, the, the numbers might have to be different for those as well. Yeah, I think on, under number four should be near term or immediate. I, I think we need to make communities aware of funding sources as soon as possible. Otherwise, they may not do anything.
this is our first public meeting, Brian. What was that, Jeff? The first public meeting. The first public meeting? Like a uh, roadshow meeting? Yes, uh -huh. Uh, in El Paso, it's going to be the 27th of October. All right. You ought to have some kind, some kind of material there. How Jason ties in. I'm sorry, I didn't really catch that. It was hard to hear. There has to be an education meeting, and that we put that in. Okay. Um, so, regarding that um, recommendation, potential recommendation for tying the funding of the flood plan to communities that participate in the NFIP, is that something that we need to, Omar, do you know the pro process for subcommittee making recommendations? to the general planning group? Is that done with the vote similar to like an action to vote? Isn't that the only way for the process to go forward is if we recommend that? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Our subcommittee would yeah. need to recommend make that recommendation and then we can present that in our next uh, planning group meeting. I agree. Uh, So we're at the point now where we're we're ready to to have someone from the subcommittee make the recommendation. <laughs> what 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 is the recommendation for? Uh, Presentation well, general membership. Uh, it will be, yeah. I mean, you'll you'll be recommending it to the full blown membership. Uh, the flood planning group and that that meeting um, originally was set for October the 5th, but I needed to move it to the 7th because I did not post it in a timely manner. So we have it for October the 7th at 9 a.m., which is a Thursday. So Brian, do you have to have this covered in the next planning group meeting? We don't have all the columns in this table. We haven't digested the other table that was recommended. Or can, we, can we put this off? Uh, so, Lily, can you actually go to um, slide two or three? Uh, so the there are two potential uh, paths of recommendations. Uh, the the one that we're talking about potentially right now is the top one. The adoption of re region specific minimum floodplain management or land use standards, and those would be tied to the flood plan uh, to for for communities to be eligible uh, for funding through the flood plan. Uh, that's separate from the goal setting that we've talked about. So I don't think we're ready to make any recommendations at this point on the goals. But uh, as a minimum, you know, if, if if there's consensus within the group that that is a good idea that would like to adopt that or make that a requirement for those communities to participate, you know, as an early, you know, initial uh, impetus to get them moving on that, you know, in the short term, that could be an option. Uh, so that's what we're proposing now. You're proposing under tax 3A or 3B? 3A. But the table we've been dealing with is not going to The table is for task 3B. So I just got it all muddled. Sorry about that. So, um, do we. Can you go, Lily, can you go to task or slide? Um, where it says tasks 3a scope of work i think it's slide 15. yeah so this is what we it sounded like there were several individuals who expressed interest in this and so i was wondering if 
if there's enough interest to make a rec formal recommendation at this point on that suggestion. So the suggestion being tying NFI, NFIP participation uh, as a minimum floodplain management standard that an entity must adopt prior to them including an FME, FMS, or FMP in the flood plan. And, and those flood plain management standards are to be determined, correct? I guess in the future. Plain management standards. Well, so the. Or you're talking it, about just the NFIP? And stuff, yeah, that right? was just a suggestion. Yeah, we could we could build that list as we go. But one, you know, if, if that's a specific standard that. Uh, could be adopted or th that you would like to. Uh, adopt at a region level as a minimum standard for flood plan participants, you can do that now. I think it can be, you know, a sequential process where, uh, well, I don't know. I, I don't, I, I don't mind. I, I think that's, that's a good idea to, to require the NFIP participation. And obviously by doing so, you have to adopt, I guess, the, those flood plain management, uh, standards i guess by, by default um, but i guess when i i just saw that the land use standards i guess is right. where it for me was a, a little bit of a, a red flag because we, we we obviously can't regulate the land use in the county right and so that may may mean that i mean of all the standards to potentially apply to this part of the scope of work in the nfip participation seems to be the most the most direct way to enforce that. I guess just my concern um, is if we do that, I don't want to exclude a community from getting help from the flood planning group. Some of them might not be and have that uh, personnel in place to enforce some of the NFP. So I, I just want to make sure we don't exclude any communities by by doing the NFIP. Right, agree. That that would be the drawback of that approach. So so what do you need? A recommendation to adopt that statement that's under three A? Uh, we don't need to take action if 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 there's not consensus or if, if you'd like to keep you know considering that uh, we can revisit it at uh, the next subcommittee meeting um, it's the next subcommittee meeting Brian. okay so it, it, and then to be honest you it's totally okay if 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 we don't if the rpg does not choose to adopt those standards this is just a choice that uh, was given in the scope of work by the TWDB2 RFPGs. You have that authority if you'd like to uh, apply it. All right. Well, I think um, this is Jeff. So, so the the issue is, I think we have to. De one suggestion is that we develop this from the bottom up. That basically we we set a goal for the next meeting that people think about. There are people who, particularly the ones that are on this committee, think about how the issues they've had in floodplain management and where they could get improvement either by, you don't have to increase regulation, you can increase education. A lot of times things happen simply because people don't know in advance that what they're doing could cause a problem, right? So, so maybe let the, let the county people and the city people come back to the next meeting and, and in these categories, floodplain management, land use, don't get don't get put off by the word standard. We don't have to recommend standards. We can just recommend what are the issues that have been problematic in land use in, in people's choices for land use in certain locations that might be addressed by some strategy that's not 
it's not uh, it's not coercive, right? And you know what what could be done, for instance, on where has economic development occurred, which was really a bad idea for the for the particular circumstance. But again, there might be something that can be done either in terms of incentives or or something that's not coercive. That, that could improve the uh, the flood risk associated with with uh, with the current way things are going. Can we can we can we kind of put together something in an email that says please please provide examples, something that's a that's we can start with as as what what we haven't discussed yet is, is where do we need improvement. So, so what's what's the problem, and and how do we how do we make it better? So maybe we can go to the next meeting and say uh, again, in each of these categories, have some kind of matrix that says this is what the problem is, this is what the potential improvement might be, uh, you know. And again, think of things that aren't necessarily coercive. They might include coercive, but let's not. It's it's really what what the, the counties and the cities and the other people on the committee think might work that would improve the situation. And we can get money for for either developing the education or disseminating the uh, or studying the situation to find where where these situations we've seen that are wrong have occurred that we can fix. Right? I think I think Gilbert has in his head Gilbert Salvani has in his head. All sorts of cases that he knows, but I really wish this had gone a different way. And if we we, we start off thinking about each of those circumstances and provide some structure on how to how to address it, different levels of uh, of uh, pressure, and, and have there be both carrot and a, and a stick in it. I think that's I think that's what we're after. But we we haven't really discussed what the problems are. So let's can we can we set a goal for the next meeting that we after this meeting we basically put out something that's basically a a, uh, a structure for for the people in this committee to comment on that lets us get to this goal. Okay. If if you all come to that decision, you want to take that approach. I would just, um, just inform you all that we already had posted the agenda for general membership for next Thursday, and this is an agenda item, so we would just table that, or there would be no action taken because there still would not be recommendation from the subcommittee. I think I think you 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 describe what I just said in that agenda. Say we're making progress on this, and this is how we're doing it. If that's a suggestion. Just, just to comment from this is Dave again. Um, if we want to use this statement, I think it's really important that we define very clearly what the minimum flood plain management or land standards are. Um, to me, the statement is rather nebulous. If if there aren't there isn't specific information on those standards, um, I, I think that has to be defined much more clearly than it is. It's kind of left out by just putting the word standards in here. What are the standards? Exactly, and I think it's we're we're. Well, I think this is again my suggestion. My suggestion is that we we start off figuring out what it is that that we don't that we think can improve management. And we decide whether it has to, whether to achieve that improvement. We we need a standard, or whether we can just do it via some kind of incentive or via some kind of education in different levels of. Different levels of, of uh, addressing it, right? I don't. I think, and I think this this issue. I think we have down in the goals. We have 
we're addressing what we think is required in order to get funding. You have to be, so we have these goals to be in the NFIP and we have the goal to be uh, in the NFIP CRS and then we have the goals to be, you know, improve our CRS. Those are, those are good goals which address this and essentially make it a minimum, minimum, you know, you have to say what it is, but it, it has some impact on their ability to get funding in yeah, if, if we were to adopt this statement, you can take the word standards a hot link and have the standards listed in that hot link. Yes, ultimately. Okay, yeah, so we can try to we can unpack the uh, different standards that for example, make up the NFIP minimum requirements. Uh, we can you know, use those to potentially build a list of standards. And then if, if it's if we decide that all of those NFIP minimum requirements do make sense, then we could just package it all into that potential, you know, uh, using the NFIP participation uh, as the minimum standard. Um, yeah. That makes sense to me. Okay. Yeah, so we'll. we'll that also makes it measurable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I want to I know if the mass police just showed up. Why did you guys just put your masks on all of a sudden? <laughs> because Omar stepped out of the room and, and he's back now. <laughs> Oh, so that means you have to mask up? <laughs> okay. I know. I know, Dave. I know. There's some. We'll talk about that. <laughs> okay. Later. <laughs> I thought maybe the mask police showed up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry. Not a Had problem. to be a little now and then. A little humor. I'll take it. I hope the rest of the group will. So we certainly got our direction. I don't know if anyone else has, has any other comments, um, but it doesn't sound like there are any specific recommendations at this point, but uh, potentially in the next subcommittee meeting, we'll be able to uh, look at those further. Well, we've got four on the list, I think, don't we? Or five? Right, those are the, those are ideas for goals that we'll, we'll uh, review and refine. Uh, but it doesn't sound like any of these are going to be formal recommendations at the next planning group meeting at this point. Oh, okay. So we're planning on tabling there? Okay. It does sound like that, which is, is okay. Hey, well, I, well, I need to ask a question. I saw an article in the paper about a Corps of Engineers study on central El Paso watershed. Is that known by all now? Okay. It's what kind of impact is that going to have on what we're doing? You said there's a course study that came out or they're working. Yeah, and, and in the El Paso Times on 7 September, there was an article about US Army Corps of Engineers to study Central El Paso watershed. And it's apparently a, like a $3 million feasibility study. And I just wondered how that's going to be integrated or how we integrate that with us and how that, how that joins the entire process. Dave, uh, Gisela Tangino from El Paso Water, uh, she is in the know on this effort. She couldn't join us today, but let's be sure to ask her uh, next time we see her. Okay, all right. I'll try to remember that. You try to remember. You have a younger brain than I do. I will ask her for you, yes. <laughs> I'm also okay, very curious. Okay. So are we all uh, Dave, but, but just, just to answer that question, um, this is Chris Wright with AECOM. Um, yeah. We, we will be considering when we're coming up with uh, flood management evaluations 
if there are areas that need to be studied uh, and we are aware of ongoing studies such as those, we will have to consider when those studies might come out and that could affect uh, certain flood management strategies or certain flood management projects, um, just p depending on the timing of, of when that additional information comes out. So, yeah, I would say that's definitely important for us to um, coordinate with the core on that, and, and that is part of our scope um, of coordinating with the core. On and so we should we should be able to get um, some more information about you know, when that information will be available and see see how to affect certain flood management strategies and projects that we come up with. Great, thank you. Are we, are we good for, for this item now? Let's go on to the next agenda item. Oh, we're still got more agenda. Okay. Yeah, I believe, I believe we're good. Okay, so number four, com, uh, confirm the chair of subcommittee. I'd like to delegate that to somebody brave enough to, to hop out in this. Uh, currently, uh, I'm not able to meet the commitment of every chair of every subcommittee. So I'm wondering who can help us out with this. The only thing that we would need to do is whoever would like to, if anybody would like to serve as the chair, we need to have the physical location of the meeting be at your facility because under the Open Meetings Act, we need to have these meetings available to, to the public if they were to um, want to participate. So, so for instance, it'd be hard for Dave to have the meeting at his home uh, if he wanted to chair, but if he did want to chair, he could come to the Council of Governments and we could run the meeting from there. I don't mind doing that if you want me to. I, I don't want to grab it though if somebody else is interested. Well, we, we definitely see you, I believe in subcommittee two, we're, we're going to have a, this dilemma in all three. So there's more than enough to go around for everyone. <laughs> so whoever would want to step up for subcommittee one. I think Dave will make, make an excellent chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> all right, well then that means that means that everything has to be at the cog, the yes, real sir. cog. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. I obviously can't do it at my house. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could, and well, I, no. That, if you want to entertain that way, I don't. Think, maybe that would not be the, the worst thing. But um, my dogs, oops. My dogs might eat whoever showed up in person. <laughs> okay. Well, then we will not do that. So let's. Um, okay. So then, do you want to make a motion um, then? All right. So then, item number five, tentative dates. Those are already set, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, just in terms of the motion to appoint Dave. Okay, so I'd like to entertain a motion to appoint Dave um, as the new uh, chair of uh, subcommittee one. And that would be Gilbert would be the first. Make yes. the motion. Okay. Yes. I'll second that motion. I'll I'll second. Thank you, sir. The first and a second. Any further discussion? Anybody else want to desperately take away <laughs> this <laughs> responsibility from Dave? All right, with no further comments. Um, all in favor, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, motion passes. All right, and then uh, agenda at five is the times. The uh, tentative future committee. Okay, so uh, agenda item number five, tentative future committee dates for this subcommittee, subcommittee one. Those haven't been set. I, I, I don't, we, uh, AECOM, do you have any suggestions in terms of the frequency of the meetings and the, the dates? Um, so we, we will be uh, working more intently on these tasks in the, you know, in the next coming months. Uh, so I think we may need to meet more frequently now and then we'll, it won't extend through the duration of the flood planning process, but uh, we can scale back later. So maybe would, would every uh, three to four weeks be reasonable for this group? Or um, I think just to align with the sub with the general planning group meetings would be good so that if we meet right before the planning group meeting, we're prepared to have a recommendation if, if, if uh, applicable. So then uh, that would take us 
one, two, like, uh, like the 21st of October. I mean, no, right now we're on a, yeah. The 21st of October would be the third week. From yes. When's the next, we've got a flood planning meeting at on the 2nd of November, is that right? For the general membership? No, yes. it's not. Or no? No. The, the general, the third meeting is uh, on October 7th. Right, but yeah. the following that, there will be one on November 2nd. Oh, November 2nd. I, I apologize. Sorry, Dave. Okay, so if we want to have a, one of these, a subcommittee meeting, then can we do it on the 28th of October? The public meeting's on the 27th okay. at H2O. So. He said that. <laughs> Does the 28th work, work okay for our next event? So my only comment on that is that we we thought about this idea of having the importance of funding in the public meeting, some kind of presentation on that. It might be useful to have a meeting before the public meeting so we can we can alter that presentation if you all think it needs improvement. Well, the the twenty the twenty the 21st is a water planning meeting, a pre-meeting in Clint. Uh, so that's a different group that I'm in. <laughs> All day, Dave. How about lunch? <laughs> well, by lunch. I said we could just hang out here all day in Clint. Yeah. Oh, on the 21st, you mean? Yeah, we could do the, we could do the, the 20, we could do a uh, flood planning in the morning and then at 1.30 is Water planning. Okay, that's fine. And if y'all want to see the balance, at, uh, <laughs> at the real cost. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Say that again, Dave. Just have it there instead of the cog. Yes, sir. Because that meeting's in Clint. Okay, that's fine. Is that okay with you, AECOM? And then the group. Are you guys okay? You can still participate virtually. Only Dave and I would. Would need to be all right which which date did you say i'm sorry uh, october 21st 21st okay yeah that works and we'll at do at, at 10 o'clock yes yeah. Emma, that's okay that'll work yeah that's fine that's a good idea we can just do both up there then yes okay, okay. and then i also want to say congratulations to javier he is now a certified pro plane manager that's a uh, Nice hurdle. Congratulations. We're, we're proud of you. Hopefully more of us can, can do the same, right? Thank you. Welcome to the club. <laughs> no, thank you. OK, so then uh, I think that would be the I think that's the last item. Mm -hmm. OK, motion to adjourn. Second. I guess the chair can so move. OK. Have you, sec have you seconded? Okay. First and second. Uh, all in favor, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 You opposed? Okay, motion passes. Thank you, guys. Okay, we'll yes. see uh, you. several of you at, at one o'clock for the subcommittee three. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, if everyone. There's something, Thanks. If there's something special that I need to be able to do as a result of being a chair, I need to know. Just keep me on my feet. That's all. Just. Help me uh, other stay. Than, other than showing up in person. All right, then. <laughs>